Hi, I'm Gary and this is episode 140 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be talking with a number of charge point operators. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. Before we start, I wanted to apologise to anyone expecting this to be the round table episode at the end of the season. For various timing and logistical reasons, I wasn't able to get this organised in time to be a part of this current batch of 20 episodes. So I now need to sit and work out whether I want to do a one-off additional episode to present the round table, or whether I leave it until the next season and we bookend that season with a round table to start and a round table to end. Or do I just completely skip it for this season? If you've got any preferences, let me know by emailing me at evmusings at gmail.com. Our main topic of discussion today is charge point operators. But first, let me start with the story. You've probably all been to shopping malls now that things have opened up after the pandemic. In a lot of these malls, you see in the middle of the walkways those carts that sell things like phone cases or jewellery or earrings or eyebrow threading services. You know the ones I mean. Now, let's imagine you owned a franchise which allowed you to put these carts in at shopping malls around the country. Now, bear in mind that in our fictional example, there's a large capital cost to start the franchise and you won't make a lot of money on each sale. Your first job then is to identify where in the country you want to set these carts up, which malls. If you're any good as a businessman, or business person, businesswoman, whatever, you're going to set them up in places where there's lots of footfall and high demand. Brent Cross Shopping Centre in London, Westfield Shopping Centre in Stratford or Shepherd's Bush, the Bull Ring in Birmingham, the Trafford Centre in Manchester, maybe the Buchanan Gallery in Glasgow. The last place you're going to put a capital-intensive, low-profit cart like that is in a small venue like the Broughton Shopping Park in Chester or Cardinal Park in Ipswich. The economics don't work out. Of course, yes, there are going to be people in Chester and Ipswich who might want whatever it is you're selling from your cart. But the point is, there aren't a lot of them. It's much easier and more profitable to find the places with the high throughput of people who want your goods rather than the small places where the demand isn't quite as big. And it's pretty much the same for charge point operators. They have a capital intensive product which has a niche appeal at the moment with very thin margins. So naturally they're going to place them in locations which will maximise their return. And that's why the highest concentration of charges is in London and the lowest is in places like the middle of Wales. The economics work out that way. Yes, there are EV drivers in Wales who want their cars charged with high power public charging. And yes, there are drivers in Ipswich and Exeter and Cumbria and, 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 and. And they all want good public charging. But if you're a charge point operator who is capital constricted, I mean, there's no magic money tree for chargers. There's just, you know, a fairly limited investor base. You want to put the chargers where they'll get the best use for the invested money. Now, Tom Callow, previously from BP Pulse, now with My Energy, has stated in the past that the most used charger on the BP Pulse network deals with about 30 charges per day. Now, I'm not sure where this is exactly, but I bet it's probably the mini hub at Hammersmith. Conversely, checking ZapMap indicates that there are BP chargers in the wild in places like Wiltshire and Devon that get used you know, once every couple of days. I was recently at the new BP Pulse hub in Gatwick, Lovely facility with five 50 kilowatt charge and three of the dual charging 350 kilowatt Alpatronic units. And I was the only one there. But we're constantly told that there isn't enough public chargers to deal with the capacity. So how do we square this circle? Well, the places we need chargers built are either places where they already exist, such as in London, but are constantly busy. Or they're in the remote places where there aren't many chargers that don't get used that often. But when they're needed, they're absolutely needed. Tom Callow, again, is famous for saying that if we used all the public chargers 100% of the time, we could deal with 10 times as many charge sessions as we do now. Well, I mean, that's all well and good, but nobody's going to trek out to the Charge Place Scotland Rapid Charger in Melvich on the far north coast of Scotland at 3am on a Sunday morning to make sure they're availing themselves of the available capacity there, are they? So that's the dilemma the CPOs are faced with. Spend lots of money putting charges in where the demand is there but not great, or spend the same money putting charges in where there's a huge amount of demand. It's no coincidence that Instavolt recently added an extra eight Alpatronic chargers to the Banbury hub to go with the existing eight chargers. The demand is there and it can be justified. 
more so when you realise that these charges are two minutes drive away from an Osprey hub and only a short drive from Cherwell Valley Services, which has a couple of grid server units. It all gets very complicated when we start to talk about sighting charges, power ratings and other esoteric things that charge point operators have whole departments dealing with. Today, I'm going to be talking with a number of charge point operators to ask the questions that I think we all want answering about public charging. I'll be talking with James McKemmy, who's the Head of Policy and Public Affairs from Podpoint, Dee Humphreys, Managing Director of Equan's EV Charging, which is the company that owns and operates the Genie Point Network, and Tom Hurst, UK Country Manager and Network Development Manager from a CPO currently with a relatively small UK footprint, Fastnet. The first question I wanted to ask everyone was the location one. Everyone wants lots of chargers all over the place. They also want cheap charging. But the fact is, this is never going to happen. Charging hubs are expensive. Even individual units are expensive. So charge point operators need to prioritise where they put their units. I asked Tom from Fastnet about their location strategy. We really do focus on areas that are you know, high traffic, um, where we are, our station will be very accessible on the main road or just off the main road, for example. We don't want you, uh, I guess, yeah, going on a big rat run to get to the charging facility because that's, that's just not a positive customer experience. These sites also need to be uh, enable us to build our, our canopies and, and, or, and or our wings to make sure that you're visible and our, our station is visible and that you can navigate here visually. Because obviously, you know, everyone says, oh, you know, you've got apps, you've got, you know, navigation within the vehicles to get to these charging stations. But in reality, once you get to the, you know, sort of dot on the map where the charges are, you've still got to navigate around a car park or a retail site or mm -hmm, yeah. whatever it might be. And, and, and by then you've got to be navigating visually because it's not safe to be staring at your app or your, you know, your navigation screen. So that, that, that basic description, right, high traffic, accessible uh, and visible locations comes across the whole country. Wherever cars are driving today is where EVs are going to be driving in the future and we want to be serving them. So, I, I mean, in general, uh, certainly if you look at, you know, the actual sites that we've got open right now, there's a big gap right between the sort of southeast uh, where we've got uh, four sites and then the northeast where everyone goes, you know, what, 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 what's in between? And that's not so much a question of strategy. That's just a question of timing. As I say, we try and build our sites as quickly as possible. As soon as we get, you know, our location deal done, we take the site through planning, we get the grid connection and we build it as quickly as we can as well. All those uh, elements are key. And we try to run them as much as we can in parallel to de-risk uh, and speed things up. But there are always un you know, unforeseen events come, come planning, come grid connection, etc. Does that mean, um, yeah, at the moment, uh, we've got this you know, pretty stark gap uh, in the Midlands at the very least. And uh, as you say, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland as well. But these are all areas where we are actually developing sites. We have them uh, in, in the uh, location pipeline. And uh, it's just a matter of time. So certainly just to give a bit of a sort of look at what's coming up, we've got sites coming, another, another couple in Scotland in the not too distant future, Suffolk, Wiltshire, Hampshire. And, you know, I mean, I guess the eagle eyed viewer can probably, um, you know, do some searches of planning applications and see what's coming. We are a little bit reluctant to announce in advance uh, where we're going to build, because uh, as we've learned, there are many things that can go wrong in that uh, in the run up to opening a site. And uh, you don't want to give false expectations to to drivers and get people overexcited. I much prefer to make at least a, a little splash, if not a very big splash when we open a site and um, and then it's there, it's real, you can navigate there. It's not speculative, let's say. And, and that, yeah, that's absolutely key for us. Dee from Genie Point talked about how they're working with certain landlords to provide their charging locations. So I think probably similar to a lot of the CPOs, we, we look for partners who've got lots of land across, across the country. So you're looking for retail destinations like Morrison's, leisure destinations like Whitbread. And the name of the game is to get a partnership with them. So we have the right to install and then to look at all of their locations and understand which ones are a priority. So then we would look, so for example, with Whitbread, we then look at, OK, what's a busy hotel location? Aside from the hotel, what else is there? Is it going to be busy in season? Is it going to be busy all year? And actually, there's always a consideration of what's nearby. So admittedly there will come a point where we need all the infrastructure we can get and everybody be, everybody will be making money regardless but if I'm looking at a premier in location that might be really good but actually a competing CPO has got a 120 a 150 and a 300 across the road my little 50 kilowatt charger is probably not going to get a lot of love so, and, and rightly not from the driving community because they'll go where it's faster and there are multiple choices so we make a decision based upon what's in the local area, 
how we think behavior is but all of that is desktop exercise unless we've got people who live nearby or we get some good anecdotal information from people that live there so whenever we do get those tweets and we get those recommendations through I do take them really seriously I make a point of reading through them having a look at zap map seeing what's there and then understanding if we've got a host location anywhere near there and if they'd be up for looking at a charging uh, charging unit sometimes there are areas that are a really obvious opportunity where we desperately want to put a charger, but we don't have a host. Or if we do have a host, they might have tenancy agreements that prevent them from installing at that point in time. There will always be locations that to to a driver and to me and to you are really obviously crying out for charging, but there is some or other tiny quirk that means we can't quite get there just yet. But I would urge people to keep the recommendations coming. I think they're Uh, you know local knowledge as much as we can do the desktop surveys and we can do the assessment and all the rest of it I always maintain that charger placement is as much art as it is science and quite a lot of that art is down to understanding what drivers want. Podpoint have a slightly different business model because the majority of their charging is fast rather than rapid although they do have rapid charging around the country. James McKemmy talked about this. Where we've put fit chargers tend to be quite neatly defined within the bounds of where those uh, commercial partners' properties might be. And that takes a lot of the decision making out of that. So, you know, we, we by, by virtue of working with Lidl and Tesco, we actually have a really good national coverage in all sorts of places. We might be, you know, a, hand, you know, a large proportion of the only chargers around those towns, etc. Uh, because of that. I, I think your question was more th- that towards the proactive investment in, in using you know, our own uh, uh, financing or, or, or debt to, to install charging infrastructure. As I say, from from PodPoint's standpoint, we we want to work with people who are already dragging a lot of guys uh, and girls to their sites, right? We 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 that's how we decide our where we want to put our, our our charging infrastructure. So, a lot of those proactive decisions now, well, there is a there's a degree of that 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 goes on, and and, and something certainly that PodPoint will be looking to to work uh, work in that area moving forward. But regardless of this, we still have charging wastelands in numerous places around the UK. I mean. Why not put a load of charges across Wales, for example? And the question there is, you know, why are there deserts, I think, uh, and certainly mid Wales? Well, obviously, if you look at the, the population density of Wales and indeed the way people travel around Wales, south and north Wales, the, the transit seems to be quite lateral. There isn't really a lot that goes north south. And the population density in the middle of Wales, obviously, is very low. And as a, as a result of that, it, it, it can be a slightly less compelling place to put to invest in in charging infrastructure. Regardless of this, whenever any charge point operator puts out a tweet announcing the opening of a new charger or a hub, there are always responses along the lines of, it's all well and good putting charges in that location, but when are you coming to Wales slash Cornwall slash Lincolnshire slash fill in the blanks? So I asked the charge point operators if they wanted to let the listeners into the sort of discussions that take place around identifying charger locations. Yeah, so I, I would say the balance um, in, in the UK anyway is very much on the, the leasehold side of things. So yes, working with landlords, motivated uh, location portfolio partners uh, to bring our infrastructure to their sites. And there are a number of good reasons for doing that, not least that I would prefer that we invest our capital in building the infrastructure rather than the, the freehold, let's say. At the same time, if the price is right, if the location is right, we will absolutely consider a, a freehold acquisition, You know, buying the land. And indeed, we are doing that in a few locations as well. So uh, it'll it'll be a mix. And it, it really comes down to what is the route to getting this infrastructure built as quickly as possible. With this, obviously, it's different for PodPoint. Their destination offering is more widespread in terms of location. They're at most of the larger Tesco stores, for example. So yeah, it probably won't stun you to learn that we're pro-installing more charging infrastructure. Um, that, that's sort I'm of shocked. Our, 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 <laughs> our raison d'etre. So um, you, you needn't worry that we wouldn't be encouraging that at every possible opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um I, I, I shop at Tesco. I, look at, uh, I, I shop at a, a Tesco in a town called Burgess Hill. Uh, and the first couple of times I turned up to find all four occupied, uh, I, I felt personally affronted. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? I, you know, <laughs> well, I was involved with this. How dare you take these places? Um, so that happens very regularly. Um, one of the things we had to push back at, uh, against was the idea that a seven kilowatt is pointless in that location. 
And to many users, they will feel that way because uh, they're used to using DC chargers. Why would I want to bother getting my cable out when I'm only going to get 20 plus miles in the time I do my shopping? And, and you know, that's that's if that's your view, that's absolutely fine. What the data has shown us is uh, if that's not a minority view, there are an awful lot of people who, who feel very differently and they're very happy to collect some some additional mileage, which is kind of our view of it. You know, your, your car is sat there anyway. Why not? Um and it's very clear that we're getting really good utilization. We're very, very happy um, with, with the way that's rolling out. And, and the nice thing is it would appear Tesco's are very happy with it as well. Um, as a result of that, there would arguably, arguably be scope to increase the amount of charging infrastructure and not just AC. I think um, w- one of the things where we've seen in, uh, as an industry dynamic is the 50 kilowatt charger is really no longer good enough as an en-route charger. Yeah. What it has become is a really valuable, paid-for, quicker destination charger, or some sort of hybrid destination on route charger between the two. Um, and and I, I think Tesco's is a really great location for those. Um, we are relatively limited in our rollout at the moment, and that's to do with uh, grid capacity, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But you know, may, maybe we want to expand both of those moving forwards. Um, uh, you know, if we weren't having those conversations as, as a charging <laughs> infrastructure firm, you'd be rather stunned, wouldn't you? So I would. uh, oh, clearly, no, nothing I can, I, I can announce, but certainly we would be absolutely pro expanding all kinds of charging infrastructure into, our, into sites like Tesco's and Lidl and all others. You may have seen recently in the socials that Fastnet have been part of a group that have opened a new charging hub at an Oxford park and ride. I was invited to the opening of this fabulous site. Numerous Fastnet Alpatronic 350 kilowatt chargers with dual charging capability, a big bank of Tesla superchargers, and a long line of 7 and 22 kilowatt fast chargers for those staying all day. Here's what Tom had to say about that. Yeah, well, I'll see if I can do justice to it. And certainly, um, you know, I think big credit is uh, afforded here to Oxford City Council, but also Pivot Power. Mm -hmm. The two of them really led in the, as you say, the genesis of, of this project. Um, and, and taking it from an idea, a basic concept, through to what is now currently a fantastic charging location with great you know, uh, accessibility for users, high power charges that help you know, a number of different kinds of stakeholder within Oxford and around Oxford uh, to, to yeah, make that switch to electric. So, I mean, I think the basics of it start maybe three years ago. I mean, I, I was first talking with, with various uh, parties in this about this maybe three years ago or so. Uh, with the concept of uh, the pivot power um, uh, grid connection and their 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 hybrid battery uh, taking power to to Redbridge Park and Ride and using it to deliver a sort of world class charging facility for uh, yeah the, as I say the users of Oxford and 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 beyond. So obviously there's there's bus charging as a part of the story. There's uh, the heat pumps uh, to residential units side of the story that's really interesting as well and <laughs> not best place to talk to. But how Oxford got involved was to say, right, this is this is land that we have, um, this is land that we have control over, and we want to, you know, um, have a transparent, open tender for this location and, and for the right to build in this location. Uh, so Pivot was bringing the power. Uh, other operators, charge point operators, were then bidding for the uh, the right to build on that site and effectively to use uh, the connection from from Pivot to to bring it forward. So we then collaborated with Tesla on the the DC side of the story. Uh, to, um, from our perspective, give an excellent offer to the yeah to the people of Oxford, basically. So that's the, the I guess the DC, DC charging site side of the story, and we we certainly were deeply involved then from planning application all the way through to the final construction uh, of the shared technical enclosure, for example, obviously of our station and and the, the roadworks associated with that. The other side of the story then is is the the AC um, charging story. This this is what's really interesting and I think very relevant for um, other locations like this across the UK, of course, because a park and ride, you know, fundamentally its first, its first business case is to leave vehicles outside the city so that you can travel into the city sustainably without, you know, mm-hmm. air pollution. And uh, as such, it's got a certain kind of use case um, for the drivers that use that site. Now for DC operators like us, indeed, like Tesla car that's sat on your site for, you know, the best part of the day, for example, um, that's a lot of lost revenue because the nice thing about ultra rapids is we can sell a lot of electricity just very quickly. Now, coupling the DC story with with the AC story means that those those drivers who value uh, you know a longer residence time um, who don't need to be so quickly charged up they can leave their vehicles on I think it's what's well, well over twenty charges initially uh, to charge over the course of the day come back to a full vehicle and and that's perfect. On our side, um, if you need to do a quick turnaround, if you're a fleet driver, for example. And indeed, we've had quite a few different fleets from British Gas to DPD using our stations already. 
you can then complete your journey and, and um, yeah, your job effectively with minimal downtime. It's worth reminding you here that we have three different business models for charging here. Fastnet are all about lots of units, big hubs, high power, many locations. Podpoint are mostly about destination charging, slower units, many locations. Chargepoint are all about charge and X, i.e. you're not there just to charge your car, you're there to put some charge in and do something else. Charge and shop with Morrisons or charge and eat with Whitbread. So they each approach locations in a different way. Of course, it doesn't matter how many charges the company installs, how big a footprint they have on the ground, how fast their equipment is, if their chargers don't work. As I was chatting with Genie Point, I had to ask Dee about reliability. I think uh, it's fair to say that I share the frustrations that our drivers have and we're not doing well enough. So frankly, where we are is I think I shared a statement with our customers to address the issues around the reliability of Genie Point and what we're doing. It's not happening fast enough. So if we take uh, probably last year, we had problems where the chargers were working, but our back office wasn't good enough. It used to fall over all the time, which meant that whilst the charger was fine, you couldn't actually start or stop the blooming thing. We fixed that by moving over to AWS. So we've now got this nice, stable platform that the app should work from. However, we've had significant delays sourcing both new charger hardware. So we're trying to move away from our legacy kit because it isn't performing as we want it to. And alongside that, we've had issues trying to get replacement parts for the legacy kit. So with most of our manufacturers based in Europe and the parts that we need only being manufactured by the manufacturers themselves, We've been really struggling. And it's fair to say that I think if you spoke to me or any of my team, it's our biggest concern. It's the thing that keeps us awake at night. I'm an EV driver. I know that it's not good enough. I know that I'm struggling. Obviously, given my role, I attempt to stay just on the Genie Point network where I can um, because I want to support my own business. And I'm finding that increasingly difficult, as are many of our drivers. So... We were, you know, ChargePoint Services, as was, was acquired by NG, which subsequently became Equins. ChargePoint did some incredible work. You know, they were first to market in a lot of areas. They were pioneering in a lot of areas. But unfortunately, what's happened is kit that we were expecting to work for a lot longer uh, is no longer working. So we're currently working with the hardware manufacturers to find the root cause of the problems we're having. Um, And we've got an ongoing quality improvement plan. But I'm really conscious that telling people we have an ongoing quality improvement plan doesn't help a driver whose charger is out 75% of the time. It's it's, it's the mythical ongoing quality plan. Um, all All I can say on this call, I guess, given that those discussions are confidential, is that it's real. It's something we talk about on a daily basis. We have placed an order with an alternate supplier. So you'll see some some of our newer installs now will not have that legacy kit on. We're also looking constantly at additional hardware and we're going to start rolling out a new batch of hardware soon as well. So what that means is our new locations should, touch wood, be more reliable. But also as we work through this improvement plan with our existing supplier and they, in fairness, make great strides with the parts availability and the parts delivery, we should bring that network back up and running. So I believe, and I know it's not big numbers, but I believe, we, I believe we've bit, fixed sort of seven charges in the last week and we'll carry on at about that rate. Um, so we will continue to ramp that rate up, but it will be a minimum seven a week that get fixed. A couple of things that come out of that. Seven charges upgraded per week will mean the whole Genie Point network of 500 Rapids will be upgraded in about 18 months. And I asked Dee if she thought that given the large number of issues they've had with their hardware, had Genie Point made an error choosing the hardware supplier that they did? Now, obviously, in hindsight, the, the decision might have been different. Here's what she had to say. That's probably an unfair question to the supplier. I think that the if we had our, what we know now in terms of data, in terms of when they hit a certain point or when they hit a certain level of usage, would we buy them again? Probably not, because we want our charges to last for longer. But do I think anybody in that relationship acted in bad faith or made a poor decision? No, probably not. Because actually, given the information that was available at the time, uh, the new to market element and the kind of nascent industry, I actually think the supplier acted in good faith, creating the best product they could at the time. Uh, And I believe that the previous leadership team from ChargePoint Services bought what they believe was the best product at the time. Um, So whilst I think hindsight's 2020, 
and we possibly wouldn't buy the same kit again today, I don't think we knew then what we know now. Dee also shared something quite interesting regarding her personal circumstances as far as charging is concerned. I don't have a home charger. I've made it a point not to have a home charger so far, purely because I want to know that if I'm going to run a public charging network in the UK, that it is possible to be an EV driver on the public charging network. So it's a bit of a put my money where my mouth is thing that I need to make sure that I'm doing that. In addition to that, we have employee discounts on our charges and all the rest of it. I don't take that because I think it's really important that if I'm going to make decisions on price, I understand exactly what that feels like from a customer perspective. As far as I know, she's the only charge point operator leader who only public charges and pays full price, not a staff discounted rate. Which brings us nicely onto the topic of pricing. The logistics of charger pricing are complex. There are capital costs, staff costs, maintenance costs, leasing costs, and of course the costs of sourcing the electricity from the energy suppliers. In the four years I've been public charging, uh, rates have risen from 11 pence a kilowatt hour to upwards of 60 pence a kilowatt hour with a certain charge point operator. So do charge point operators make money at the rates they're charging at the moment? Here's what Tom from Fastnet had to say. I mean, yeah, obviously we, 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 we set a price that is going to be able to make a gross, gross margin. We can't continue to invest if we don't. Does that mean that you are profitable in the UK now or that the plan is such that when you get to a certain volume of charges or volume of um, charges that you will be profitable or are you making money on every charge? We're certainly racing to build a network that will be profitable in the long term. Um, I think the, the key is uh, not to be too loss making, but really our our investments right now are on the development side. So it's acri- acquiring new locations, building these sites and then operating them. James from Podpoint. When we come back again to that sort of primary strategy, if we are working with one of our one of our commercial partners, and we use the word host um, a lot of the times, so they will host our charging points. We will often look to sell the infrastructure. So we'll make a margin on providing the charging points, potentially the installation as well. And therefore, we have we have gleaned our you know commercial revenues out of that at the point the charges arrive, and then we'll have a, an agreement on how we operate those moving forward. Once a host has taken that decision, um, we will allow them to set whichever fee works for them. Now, there is an alternative to that, which is you fund it yourself, and then you are in control of of, of the the, um, uh, the the fee for usage um, moving forward. The challenge with that approach, of course, is that you then need to get a payback on the investment because you need to you know, satisfy your investment. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, you clearly have to pay over the price of electricity and you need a margin, etc. And we're seeing, it, obviously, electricity prices have really surged. And that's why we're seeing uh, quite a surge in pricing in market. If we've got a host who's, who's paid for the unit and we've got an understanding that we will set whichever fee they so wish, they can take a look at that on a totally different basis, right? That's uh, that that investment has been made. What is the purpose of the charging infrastructure being there? So, if we look at a supermarket, it's very likely to be a small incentive. So, certainly on the seven kilowatt chargers, um, those are free to use in Tesco. Um, we're under no illusion that that's going to fully charge someone's car. You know, you're, you're, you've got time limitations in these uh, car parks anyway. But what it is, it works out roughly about a day's annual, oh, sorry, an average day's mileage in a typical weekly shop. I mean, that's just a really nice to have. And that might be the deciding factor that means you arrive at that superstore versus its competitor. And as a result of that, that superstore is going to get your the, the revenue from your shopping and that margin. And the revenue and margin on the, the, the shopping is going to be rather more than you're going to hand out in terms of the electricity. So it makes very good sense to make that very affordable or, or indeed free in some cases. Now, if you've proactively invested in that charging infrastructure, you need to recoup that. So not only do you need to have the electricity paid for, but you need to get your margin to pay that back as well. So that gives us good flexibility, right? So so working with our, our, our hosts to, to really match the needs of their site gives us the ability to do both. There may be occasions where we'll seek to fund some infrastructure ourselves where that is appropriate, but other times we're very happy to sell the infrastructure in and then work with them on an ongoing basis. And D from Genie Point. Just about, I think, is the answer. But the way we calculate our price is obviously it incorporates our overheads and the cost of installation. I do think sometimes when I see the conversations on Twitter, people either 
wildly overestimate our buying power in terms of energy pricing. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, th- I think I saw somebody on social tell me that um, we're getting energy for five pence a kilowatt hour. Not going to lie. I would absolutely snap someone's hand off for that price right now, um, as I'm sure most of us would. Um, so unfortunately, you know, energy costs continue to increase. Um we had two choices. We could either stop investing in the network and rolling it out to subsidize the energy costs or continue to meet our commitments in terms of network rollout and in terms of maintenance. Arguably, we're achieving that or not, given our earlier conversation. But to do that, we needed to make sure that we increased our pricing. Now, we held our price for as long as we could after our energy price went up, but we dramatically reduced the amount of money that we make in terms of profit per kilowatt hour. And that remains true today. So although the pricing since I've been here has risen from 35 to 57 pence, we're actually making less money per kilowatt hour sold than we were at 35 pence. So there is a real squeeze on us. So we look at what our overhead is, we look at the cost of rolling the network out, obviously, all of that is budgeted for. But with the significant rise in wholesale energy prices, our energy prices have drastically increased, which has meant we need to increase our prices. Of course, the ancillary question to this, obviously, is if electricity prices drop, will the price of charging drop or is it just a one-way street? This is what Dee had to say. And to give people some comfort, where our pricing is based on our energy pricing, as our energy price will decrease, which hopefully it will over the, uh, over the coming years, we have budgeted to pass that saving back through. So, you know, there will be a reduction when we can achieve one. I also asked James about the fact that pod point charges are, in many cases, free. Now, obviously, they aren't free. The costs are covered by someone other than the driver. So how does that work? Yeah, and of course, that, that comes down to, to the host's decision. Um, they may think may, may feel that, well, if we put those charges there free, um, then we are attracting trade to our, to our site uh, and the overhead of electricity, et cetera, going through, that is worth it. And, and that's their decision. And we're, we're very happy to work with that. Now, if they start to set a fee, uh, typically we'll, we'll take a margin of, of that of that uh, uh, fee. And we have a, a, an individual individual agreement with each site on, on how that might work. Um, but I think it's still true that the majority of our, our estate, which are mainly AC, and certainly the, the majority of the AC units are free to use at the moment, because they tend to go into places which are trying to attract custom. I, I use a very regularly use a, a free to use charger in a car park, but it's a long stay car park that you pay to use all the time. Um, you know, is is that they're going to be their strategy moving forward forever? I don't know. They may well may may well choose that, and that's their prerogative, uh, and that's how we work with our hosts. It's up to them to to set whichever fee they think is appropriate. And now, if we look at some of the ones who do uh, build, so our DC units at Lidl and Tesco, those remain very competitive. I can't remember on the top of my head if it's twenty eight or twenty nine p per kilowatt hour. That obviously is covering the costs of operating the the charging infrastructure, but not a lot beyond that. The, the obvious incentive for those businesses is that people come and visit the stores. There's also been a lot of discussion recently about the motorway service areas, the MSAs. GridServe have taken over and upgraded more or less all the old Ecotricity offering, and that's great news. But there does seem to be a little bit of contention between GridServe and Welcome Break, who seem to want to do their own thing. Uh, they've installed Apple Green Chargers at, uh, amongst others, South Mims and Hartshead Mall services. And then there was the Competition and Mergers Authority ruling, which shortened down the grid serve monopoly at the motorway service areas. But we're already seeing BP Pulse putting charges in at motorway service areas uh, in the garages that they operate there. Ionity are in at a couple of different locations at the motorway services, and they have con- contractual terms, meaning that grid serve have to throttle their units to 60 kilowatts maximum at those locations. And even Instavolt have a bank of charges at one motorway service area. So how do our three charge point operators feel about installing at motorway service areas? James McKemmy from Podpoint. DC charging is a, is a, can be a challenging marketplace. And I, I do believe you've done uh, some roundtables and podcasts on this before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so typically in the world of DC, utilisation is, is relatively low. Where that is not true is at really, really sort of premium sites where you're going to be very high, highly trafficked. And it's hard to conceive of a better site than the motorway service 
uh, area for that. You know, you, you, you're on major, major trunk roads, uh, very conveniently located, no major detour and all those sorts of things. So um, there's a reason why they're premium sites. And, and certainly I think any charging operator would be happy to, to, to have access to have access to those sites. What's our vision? Well, we are a charging operator and therefore we would like to have access to, to the motorway service areas. And uh, clearly GridServe have, have a very, very large proportion of that, if not an outright uh, majority at the moment. I think you mentioned the, the CMA ruling, they're looking to, to bring more competition into, into the motorway service areas. Our view of that, I guess, is uh, we, we aren't particularly enamored with the way that's being set up at the moment there are uh, I, I mean during the process of the consultations you know the phrase came back well yes we wouldn't have designed it this way which uh, obviously our view is we would like you to design it another way please and um, <laughs> I guess our, our vision to make if, if if you were to get towards perfection would be to give individual charge point operators exclusivity per uh, motorway service area, but ensure that that no provider is owning more than uh, owning the neighboring one as well, if you see what I mean, because Mm -hmm. you want to have multiple providers. um, So you get competition because competition drives down pricing and it drives up standards. One of the challenges you have, if you start to have multiple operators in a site is it becomes incredibly difficult to model in terms of investment. What you can't possibly do is invest in the overflow charges because you, you know obviously the utilization of these things is quite peaky. And so if you're going to go down on a uh, very, very busy time, you'll find that the charging points are getting absolutely hammered. If you go through at 3 a.m. in the morning, no one's going to be on those things. If you are going to have one of those sites, it's much, much easier to model the utilization if you know that you're going to be the provider in that site versus a number of providers with their infrastructure in different places scattered about the site. You've got a load of different factors to understand there. You know, what are the charging points which are in the best location possible for those who want to use the facilities, etc. So giving exclusivity per site for us would be great, but then you'd need to ensure that you don't have two uh, from the same provider kind of next to each other because you need to give drivers a choice to to enable the competition between them to us that would be the ideal way of doing it now it's an incredibly tricky uh, situation you know that would be completely unpicking a whole load of commercial agreements and, and setting it up that way but i think where we're going at the moment probably isn't a particularly satisfactorily competitive landscape that we're going to get uh, in our view. Now, if something comes out of that where we've got an opportunity to potentially invest um, in a way where we can, that we can make sense of that, then we'll certainly have a look at that because we, we do believe motorway services will be a, uh, yeah, a premium and, and high value site for the uh, for, for um, en route high power charging. Tom Hurst from Fastnode. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, as you say, it's it's our history, right? We started the business on the, the, the motorways. For now, that was how we built our market presence. That's how we built our brand um, and and delivered the, the, the first phase of our strategy. But the UK is different, right? As, as you've already described, so it's different in terms of competition. It's different in terms of who owns and controls the MSAs. And I guess the, also as well, the role of motorways in UK driving, they're, they're a particular uh, strategic asset here compared to other other um, other markets. So certainly it was right. Um, I think that the you know the, the competition markets authority took a look at competition at the MSAs last year, and we'll certainly keep a close eye on how that decision will impact the market. And finally, it will come as no surprise to anyone that GD Point are not actually looking at this just yet, as it doesn't fit in with their current strategy. So at the moment, it, it absolutely isn't on our horizon. So we are, as, as I said earlier, we're kind of charge and X rather than charge and go. And our focus is very much on that sort of local community where people work, where people eat, where people shop, not that sort of en route distance charging. That's sort of our, our market niche is that we want to be there. Um, if that changes massively and we see a, a huge pitch towards you know, everybody wants to only charge at motorway service stations, then we would revise that that strategy. But for the time being, that charge and X position suits us. For me, at the moment, it doesn't quite fit with who we are um, and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and it doesn't quite fit for us in terms of the congestion around it, if I'm honest. As I brought the conversation to a close, I wanted to move on to a key part of the discussion around charger design and accessibility. Charging started as something that a couple of people do, which was something of a novelty at the time, and it's now grown into a huge business. 
I think there's a case to say that a lot of charge point operators are running in catch up mode when it comes to providing what is needed now versus what was needed when charging was a niche activity for basically Zoe's Leafs and Imiev's. For example, the vast majority of the UK chargers are front in or rear in parking bays where you drive into a slot or reverse into a slot and jut up against a bumper of some sort. It's very much a legacy of the sort of cars we started with, uh, with the Leafs and Zoe's that all had chargers located at the front of the car. But we're now getting to the stage where more and more last mile delivery vans are going electric and what this is doing is bringing larger and longer vehicles into the charging mix. Also vehicles with trailers or caravans attached to them. Driving charging is impractical in that situation and the preferred solution is drive through charging similar to what we currently do at petrol stations. So I asked the CPOs what their approach was to this, starting with Tom Hurst from Fastned. The drive-through station is is our you know our core product. It's what we love. Uh, it's uh, for all the reasons that you just described. It's it's the right thing to build uh, for ultra rapid um, charging. So for all the accessibility reasons you mentioned, but also for things like queue management um, and encouraging users to naturally use that infrastructure more efficiently, because we certainly believe that when you when you park in a parking bay you act like your car's in a car park and you leave it there, you, you walk a long way away, um, you stay longer than maybe you need to. In a drive through facility, it's very clear to you as a driver that there will be more users who come behind you, just as they do in a petrol station, who will be wanting to charge as well. So you take what you need and move on so someone else can complete their journey as well and, and get what they need. I think that that is fundamental for us. And we do prioritize that. And, and indeed, even in Oxford, for example, our first designs for that site did indeed have us building a, a, one of our larger drive through sites there. So we focus on making the best of it. That's, that's absolutely core. Cool. Um, but indeed, we've got more drive through sites coming. And I'm, I, again, I, I, I can't say anything right now, but I, I look forward to in the not too distant future to be able to share some of the stories and some of the sites that we have got rolling out you know, up in Scotland, further down in, in, in England as well. It's going to be, uh, yeah, some very interesting stuff. James McKemmy from Podpoint had a different approach. I mean, this really is coming to the fore quite a lot at the moment. We're fortunate enough to be on the PAS 1899 um, steering group. That's the accessible charging standard. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're working through that at the moment with a view to get towards uh, you know best practice guidance. Now, having said uh, one of the advantages of our strategy in, in public is that we can work with existing sites and that gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of pricing and uh, trying to work to give the hosts the best experience that their, their drivers uh, might want. It comes with a downside that the environment around the charging point is usually predetermined by your host. Um, so arriving on site and trying to implement perfection can be quite difficult um it, it, when when you are you know the, the, it is a pre-existing site etc mm-hmm. so what do we do about that now well there will be some some sites and and we were happy that uh, quite a lot of the the tesco ones were um raised as ones where the accessibility is really quite good mm-hmm. um which was was pleasing to see but we are looking to um you know upskill our operational and, and commercial project management function in what the best practices are likely to be out of PAS 1899 um, and we'll see that as our responsibility to inform our, our, our customers and our hosts on what what good looks like from an accessibility standpoint um, a, 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 as much as we can and, and indeed that we've got a next meeting on that on Tuesday <laughs> internally. Um, so PAS 1899, don't know, that's a, a voluntary standard which is being developed through um, uh, BSI and as I say we are on the, the steering group on that. They have an interesting model on that, it's, it's the concentric circle model. Um, so the middle circle is the charge point itself. The interface is on that. And then you start to move out from that you know, surrounding area to the charge point, surrounding environment. You're talking about you know, CCTV lighting and all those sorts of things. And yet again, Dee Humphreys has a different view on this as well. Uh, it's important that we get this right. I think everybody knows that. And it is a key consideration when installing new sites. I think historically what we've done is advised customers to do things a certain way but not held our ground strongly enough. And it's fair to say that if you did an audit of our estate, we've made mistakes. Uh, I know there is now a a company committed or an organisation committed to doing exactly that, going out and auditing for accessibility and and giving reviews. Um, And funny enough, I I just saw them pop up on LinkedIn before we started talking. So they will be a port of call for me in in the coming days. But we've spoken to Motability very briefly. Uh, We've spoken to the Disabled Motorists uh, Union and basically said, look, what are we doing wrong? And essentially, a lot of our installations are spread over 
two parking bays instead of three. Uh, and the bump stops or the kind of the curb stops are too close together to allow people to get there. Um, we've got particular charges that are up a step, where, which is just no good for anybody. So with our new installations, uh, we are working to make sure they are as accessible as possible. So, for example, we would now always advise our customers and our hosts to use three parking bays to give you enough space around the vehicles for access. Um, with the hardware suppliers we're working with now, one of the questions we have is, you know, what are you doing in terms of accessibility? How is this charger able to be operated as simply and as easily as possible uh, for anybody who's working with, with a certain constraint? So I think we're talking about lowered screens. We're talking about uh, better contrast and, and brighter screens. We're talking about getting them down off of curbs and giving you space to move around. I would ask people to continue to give me feedback. The one thing that I know when it comes to accessibility and design is that I don't know everything. I don't have that sphere of experience that actually is really useful. Yeah. And it's another incident, another issue where it's great to hear directly from our drivers. Tell us when we're making things difficult. Tell us when things aren't right. Tell us what would work for you. Um, so we'll continue to work with organisations to get the best possible advice and we'll continue to work with our customers and our suppliers to make sure our hardware is accessible as possible and placed in as accessible a position as possible um, but there will always be something we don't know. There will always be something we can do better. Uh, so I, I guess my, my Twitter is always open, I guess, is the uh, is the answer. The one thing all the CPOs I talked with were adamant about is that they aren't doing enough to deal with issues such as disabled access and safety. We've had John Brooks, uh, Bearded McBearface on Twitter on the show, talking about some of the issues he's experienced as a wheelchair using EV driver, as well as Kate Tyrrell from ChargeSafe talking about the steps ChargePoint operators need to take to ensure safety at their sites. Thankfully, all of the CPOs I talked to were keen to ensure that they were involved with initiatives such as this. There's a new standard, PAS 1899 from the British Standards Institute. It's a draft standard at the moment, which talks about accessible charging and ChargeSafe has incorporated measurements for these standards into its evaluations. But as Dee Humphrey said, Everybody is still at the stage of wanting to collaborate, wanting to work together to make things better. And I think we are kind of in the midst, obviously, of a, a massive transition here. And it isn't possible if we all pull the walls up, pull up the drawbridge and decide that uh, we're not going to work together in the future and we're all going to just do our own thing. So I do think, you know, platforms and, and initiatives like ChargeSafe are of huge benefit to the driving community. They're of great benefit to me in terms of feedback. And I know that my competitors, as it, you know, as they're, as they're kind of, technically are will be up for conversations on these this industry will solve these problems together they will find the right way to do things and we will get it done so what have we learned from this well the reputation that a lot of charge point operators seem to have gained in terms of not providing a robust infrastructure and charging through the nose for it seems to be something of an accurate but misleading one all three charge point operators i talked with are keen to get as much reliable infrastructure out there as possible at the cheapest rate they can but it's not as easy as maybe uninformed members of the public think it should be. Finding suitable locations is often difficult. We've said before on this podcast that you can't just rock up at a car park, allocate half a dozen parking slots and put a couple of charges in there. You need landlords willing to provide the space, DNOs willing to provide the power supply, councils willing to grant planning permission for the install and lots of money to put these in. Now, nobody was willing to commit to revealing the cost for the Oxford Super Hub where Fastnet installed their five Alpatronic units. But consider that an Alpatronic 350 kilowatt charger retails at around 87,000 euros for the basic unit alone, although I'm led to believe that Fastnet didn't pay full retail for them. This doesn't include the foundations, the power cabinets, the canopy, the Tesla units, the signage, or anything else. So you can see why hubs or even multi-unit installs are a huge financial gamble for charge point operators. All this needs to be paid for, and the only way it gets paid for is by the fees you and I pay for charging. Add into that the fact that electrical wholesale costs have gone through the roof recently, and you can see why pricing is as high as it is. Sad fact that we all want reliable, widespread, high-powered charging infrastructure everywhere, but we don't want to pay a lot of money for it. Unfortunately, these two things are just not compatible. Many, many thanks to Dee Humphreys, Tom Hurst and James McKemmy for their time. If you want to listen to the full interviews with my three guests, these are available on the EV Musings Redux podcast 
link in the show notes. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. We've heard about a number of attempts to do Land's End to John O'Groats in an electric car. The Tesla record already exists for a Model 3, which did it in the, the time with the shortest amount of time spent for charging. But Model S owner Rob Simons recently decided to see if he could do it even quicker. The record at the moment is 1 hour 31 minutes and 32 seconds of charging for a journey of 870 miles-ish in a Tesla. A Ford Mark E did it with a shorter charging time, but that was through hypermiling and travelling at 30 miles an hour on the motorway. So Rob set off at 5am from the top of Scotland and tried to see if he could do it with the shortest time spent charging as possible. How fast did he do it in? Watch the video to see. Well, the link's in the show notes. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. ZapMap is the go-to app for EV drives in the UK. Use it to search for available chargers, plan electric journeys, pay for charging on participating networks, and share updates with other EV drivers. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV, where I tend to spend most of my time. If you want to support the podcast and the newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link's in the show notes. Uh, don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you enjoyed this particular episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings and it takes Apple Pay too. If you want a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called Share. <laughs> oh, gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Please check it out. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. And if you did enjoy this, then why not subscribe? Uh, it's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a review, preferably five stars as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings EV with the words, she pays full price on her own network. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know, he was adamant they were getting the big widescreen TV installed in their flat. He wanted to watch the new Obi-Wan Kenobi series on the biggest screen he could. His wife was having none of it. When he asked her why, she said, I don't take that because I think it's really important that if I'm going to make decisions on price, I understand exactly what that feels like. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.